Thank you to Hero Cosmetics for sponsoring this episode of Beyond Contempt. Hey everyone, I need to tell you about Mighty Patch, which is a hydrocolloid acne patch. You know, I've had extra stress in my life lately, and my face has been breaking out more than usual. So you take their Mighty Patch, stick it on your face at night, and when you wake up in the morning, you'll see a reduction with your pimples. When you toss the patch away, you can see the grime and realize that it was doing all of the heavy lifting. Their products are cruelty-free, vegan-friendly, and super gentle on your skin. Check out the products on their website. You'll notice that they have great reviews. If you want to try Mighty Patch for yourself, use code BEYOND15 for 15% off on HeroCosmetics.com. That's B-E-Y-O-N-D-15 for 15% off. This podcast contains adult themes and graphic violence. Listener discretion is advised. A commercial-free version of this podcast is available on Patreon for $1 per month. Patreon.com forward slash Beyond Contempt Podcast. I'm Renee, and this is Beyond Contempt True Crime. The first tissue bank opened in 1949, and by the 1980s, there were over 300 banks. In 1993, the FDA took over regulating the sector. Every year, we do over a million of these allograft tissue transplants, but we still have 21 Americans that die every day waiting for that transplant. There are over 120,000 people on that waiting list waiting for those tissues. 600 of those are children under the age of 5. With so many people in need of these tissue transplants, we shouldn't be surprised that this created a market for body snatching. You're listening to Episode 24, Michael Mastro Marino. Michael Mastro Marino was born in Brooklyn, New York, on September 16, 1963. Michael described himself as being a driven individual with a quadruple A personality. One can reasonably surmise that his self-description meant he was hyper-competitive, obsessed with work success, and moved through life at a rapid pace. This same personality type can also lead a person to drug use and addiction. Michael attended the University of Pittsburgh for his bachelor's degree. He was a student athlete and played on the football team. Michael continued his graduate education at the New York University College of Dentistry. The aspiring young dentist frequented a campus tanning salon and developed a strong chemistry with a salon employee named Barbara. When they began dating, their families lovingly referred to them as Ken and Barbie. Their relationship became serious. The couple married in 1992, and the marriage produced two sons. Michael's dental practice flourished. He had businesses in both New York and New Jersey. Michael's specialty was implant surgery. He and his co-author, Michael R. Willand crafted a book about implants called Smile, How Dental Implants Can Transform Your Life. You can find it on Amazon for $48, with three reviews for an average of 3.1 stars. The critical reviews are more of a commentary on the legal trouble he encountered than the content in the book itself. Michael quickly grew a reputation as being the Mickey Mantle of oral surgeries, according to his dental technician. He took on cases that other surgeons would not consider, and he knocked them out of the park. This both made him a successful oral surgeon and an oral surgeon that collected lawsuits. His malpractice insurance got a good workout because he was sued several times for a variety of transgressions. Doctors who push the limits of oral surgery tend to be sued for malpractice, but Michael's problems extended beyond that. He was found in the bathroom, bleeding from the needle that dangled in his arm after shooting up Demerol. Demerol is an opioid drug that was used in his practice and was commonly given to patients before or after surgery to help control their pain. As he lay on the bathroom floor, his patient was alone under general anesthesia during the operation. This episode left the patient with facial nerve damage that resulted in a permanent facial droop. Michael's problems expanded outside the dental exam room as well. He was involved in a car accident and was arrested on July 7, 2000. 
Michael had cocaine, Demerol, and a needle in his possession. The charges didn't stick, and the prosecution was forced to drop them. But Michael's urine screen eventually came back, and it was positive for controlled substances. He agreed to rehab and surrendered his dentistry license for six months. Instead of refraining from practicing dentistry, he went back to working on patients. When this was discovered, Michael's dentistry license was suspended for four years. He had been to rehab several times, but it never seemed to help his drug problem. Michael's attorney claimed that his drug problems stemmed from playing college football and getting hooked on pain pills to help with the back pain. Michael's wife, Barbara, had no idea that he was taking drugs or that he was stepping out on their marriage. Whether it was his quadruple A personality or innate ability to compartmentalize his work, family, and dalliances, Michael spent a few years successfully moving between those worlds. Michael saw an opportunity in 2001 and changed career paths when he received a license that allowed him to sell donor parts to tissue banks. Tissue banks are facilities that store human tissue, organs, and bone. There are places where schools get cadavers for their medical students to dissect in anatomy class. They might use some of the tissues in medical research or in tissue transplants. Human tissue works better in the human body than does tissue that comes from animal products or that is synthetically created. Parts like corneas, tendons, heart valves, veins, skin, bones, and birth tissue can be extracted. One donor might go on to help 75 people. They might use it in burn victims or for people with torn ligaments. It can be used in gum tissue for procedures involving teeth, or they can use it in spine surgeries. There are some reasonable regulations that tissue banks have to follow. They have to keep accurate records. They must get consent from the donor or the donor's representative. And they need to screen donors for diseases. When a person dies, a tissue bank is called, and they do an assessment to see if they can accept the donor. Generally, they have to move fast because the donor has to be processed within 24 hours. The cause of death, age, and health status of the donor is examined. The bank wants to know about any chronic infections or conditions, autoimmune diseases, and cancer. They also want to know if the donor had HIV, hepatitis, or was an IV drug user within the last five years. There is also a law called the National Organ Transportation Act that does not allow tissue to be bought or sold, but tissue banks can accept reimbursements to cover the costs associated with handling and storing the tissue. Enter Michael Master Marino's new company called Biotechnical Tissue Services, which was located at the Daniel George Funeral Home in Brooklyn, New York. Biotechnical Tissue Services, or BTS, evolved into being a premier service provider for tissue banks. And as the business expanded, Michael opened another one in New Jersey. Michael started striking deals with New York City funeral homes where he would pay $1,000 per body to harvest tissue and parts. Michael and his team of cutters traveled to the funeral homes and removed the arms, legs, bone, skin, tendons, and ligaments from the deceased. They would pack the specimens in ice and send them back to their laboratory. They shipped the specimens out to processors like Regeneration Technology, LifeCell, and Tutogen. The processors would sterilize, test the samples for disease, and send everything out to distribution centers. The distribution centers would send the specimens to hospitals to be used in patients. Each order that Michael sent out generated several thousand dollars worth of profit. He can make around ten to 15000 per body. The only body parts that might not be used were heads or torsos, which would be placed in a bag for cremation. But if the deceased were supposed to be buried, the team would rebuild the body with PVC pipe. This was an acceptable way to aid with the presentation of the body for the funeral, had everything been done above board. But the rub was that the families of the deceased never consented to any of this. Joseph Nicelli was a funeral director who owned two funeral homes in Brooklyn, Daniel George and Sons Funeral Home and Regional Funeral Services. Joseph and Michael struck a deal and even worked out of the same building, which maximized the efficiency of their operation. 
Every time Joseph had a body, he would contact Michael. The body would get harvested upstairs, and Joseph would help reconstruct the body with PVC so the families of the deceased would be none the wiser. One hundred bodies later, Joseph made about 100000 from their partnership. Michael also had deals with James McCafferty and the Garzone brothers, Louis and Gerald. They owned separate funeral homes in the Philadelphia area and jointly ran the Liberty Crematorium. Michael was attracted to a partnership with these men because he didn't enjoy reconstructing bodies with PVC pipe, and their joint ownership of a crematorium seemed like a natural solution. Michael paid a standard rate of $1,000 per body. There was little regard for the sanitation of the bodies, since they would sit in the alley without refrigeration for days at a time before Michael or the cutters would show up. Identification, death certificates, or consent forms were never given to Michael. Some bodies he received were from people older than 75 years. Other bodies had diseases like HIV or hepatitis. There were no health screens performed, and there was no regard for the patients who would be recipients of the substandard tissue. The Garzone brothers and James McCafferty had exchanged over 244 bodies and received at least $245,000. However, James had only given six of those bodies. It was not as heavy of a contributor. Michael had deals with a few others in New York-area funeral homes. Jason Gano of the Thomas E. Berger Funeral Home, Scott Beyer of Profeta Funeral Home Chapels, and Sorrel Gayton of Serenity Hills Funeral Chapel. Their role in exchanging bodies was substantially less. Not obtaining consent from the family members of the deceased was an egregious decision. But even more concerning was Michael's blatant disregard for the FDA's rules regarding health screens for the deceased to protect the patients who were receiving their tissues. This wasn't an oversight on Michael's part. He actively lied about it, and even covered up the fact that some of the deceased had communicable diseases. Sometimes he would forge documents that stated the donors were free of disease or would swap blood samples so the donors with disease would pass their testing. But the money kept flowing, and Michael wasn't concerned as long as his bottom line wasn't impacted. One of the many unknowing donors who would have never made it past the FDA's line drawn in the sand was 95-year-old New Yorker Alistair Cook, the famous BBC broadcaster and host of Masterpiece Theater. BTS sold Alistair's tissues, even though he suffered from lung cancer that had metastasized in his bones. His documents were falsified to state that he died from a heart attack, and they shaved 10 years off of his age. They sold Alistair's bones and tissue for $7,000, and his family did not consent to any of this. He was cremated and was given back to his family two days after he arrived at the funeral home. We're going to take a quick break to hear from our sponsor. Thank you to Best Fiends for sponsoring this episode of Beyond Contempt. Let me tell you about this rad puzzle game. Best Fiends is a game you can play on your phone, and it's enjoyable because you go through all these levels solving challenging puzzles that actually engage your mind and keep it active. Many of us are seeking out entertainment, and this is the perfect game to fill that need. The cool thing about it is that it doesn't take up much of your time. You can put the game down and easily pick it up later on where you left off. You don't need an internet connection to play, so it's convenient, especially when your internet goes down like mine often does. Best Fiends updates the game monthly with new levels and events, so it never gets old. Engage your brain with fun puzzles and collect tons of cute characters. Trust me, with over 100 million downloads, this five-star rated mobile puzzle game is a must-play. Download Best Fiends, free on the Apple App Store or Google Play. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends. Now, back to the show. With all the bodies that were being harvested, one would have thought Michael would have been discovered sooner by an FDA audit or a disgruntled employee calling the state or even a case of bad tissue harming a patient. But it was when a new owner took over the Daniel George Funeral Home. As the new owner looked through the financial records, she had considerable concerns that the previous owner mishandled the business. She was so perturbed that she went to the police and the assistant district attorney, John Hanshaft. When they were looking through the financial records, 
the owner mentioned that there was a bone operation that took place on the second story of her funeral home. They took bodies to the second floor, then a doctor would arrive and take the bodies out the back door. The new owner found a paper trail of FedEx receipts that documented the body parts were being shipped to a company called RTI. The assistant district attorney immediately filed a subpoena for RTI's documents and started wading through all the paperwork from the Daniel George funeral home. He discovered that many of the documents were forged. The ages of death had been artificially lowered, or they changed the cause of death to something more benign. One person died from multiple organ failure at age 69 per the death certificate issued by the medical examiner. But the death certificate from BTS stated that the donor died at age 63 from a heart attack secondary to heart disease. Another death certificate issued by the medical examiner said the donor died from pneumonia at age 79. The BTS death certificate stated the death was due to a heart attack and the donor was 16 years younger at age 63. Josh also found paperwork that required the same family member to sign the consent forms, but the signatures did not match one another. There were so many things wrong with the paperwork that Josh subpoenaed Michael. Michael brought his lawyer to the prosecutor's office, and his lawyer went all out to defend him. He stated his client had done everything legitimately, and the out-of-order paperwork must have been handled by someone else, and Michael wasn't sure who would have been forging the documents. Josh did not buy Michael's weak explanations and continued the investigation. He tracked down the families of the deceased to verify that consent was given for the tissue donations. He found that most of the families had not given consent. This was the first time they heard anything about donating tissue, and it overwhelmed most everyone when they found out what was done to their loved ones. So most families gave Josh permission to exhume bodies for autopsy. Instead of finding human skeletons, they found that body parts were replaced with PVC pipes. The lower body of a deceased woman from Queens, New York, was entirely constructed of PVC, which was difficult information for the family to digest. Some processing companies had stored the blood and tissue samples that Michael had sent them per the testing requirements. When these samples were retested, they didn't match the original results that were produced by BTS. This prompted the FDA's involvement. In October 2005, the FDA inspected the BTS in New Jersey. Besides major rule violations, FDA inspectors typically focus on protocol and SOP violations, having poor processes that lead to significant errors, and paperwork that is filled out in a fraudulent or a sloppy way. The FDA found the paperwork BTS produced was unacceptable. The proper steps for determining the eligibility of a donor were not followed. They forged death certificates. BTS did not accurately report where the donor came from or if they passed away in a hospital. Permission from the families was rarely obtained, and they didn't even store the tissues properly to prevent degradation. The FDA issued a recall of all tissues that were handled by BTS. At that point, they had distributed the tissue to all 50 states, and there were even 300 tissue products sent to Canada. 10,000 people had received the tissue from over 1,000 donors that originated from the 12 funeral homes in New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania. Even though the risk for infectious disease was low, the FDA and CDC put out a guidance to the healthcare professionals that patients who receive BTS tissues need to be screened for HIV 1 and 2, hepatitis B and C, and syphilis. A few tissue recipients tested positive for some of these diseases. But because Michael did not have the records anymore, the infections could not be traced back to his business. The FDA issued a cease manufacturing order to BTS in January 2006. This order falls under the FDA's Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research and is typically used in urgent situations where an establishment clearly violates regulations and there is subsequent public risk for communicable disease transmission. Michael's wife was in the dark when it came to the way he illegally ran his tissue business. She knew that he was harvesting tissues from donors, but she didn't realize that he was breaking the law. 
Michael filled her head with the idea that he was innocent and convinced her that they were just using him to reach bigger players in this game. But when all the evidence was uncovered, it was evident that the prosecution had enough to send Michael away. After Barbara had a conversation with the prosecutor, she quickly realized that her husband was guilty. His lawyers had described to him how to run the tissue business to comply with all the regulations, but he actively chose a distinct path that disregarded the safety of patients. Barbara eventually filed for divorce. Michael knew he was cornered, so he came to an agreement with the prosecution. On February 23, 2006, they indicted Michael on 122 felony counts, and he eventually pled guilty to over 1,300 counts. In New York, it was enterprise corruption, body stealing, and reckless endangerment. In Pennsylvania, it was corruption, criminal conspiracy, theft by unlawful taking, deceptive business practices, and abuse of a corpse. In New York, he was sentenced to 18 to 25 years, and in Pennsylvania, he was sentenced 25 to 58 years. The sentences would run concurrently. Michael made $4.6 million running BTS, which he agreed to pay back to the victims' families. On July 7, 2013, Michael died in Fishkill Correctional Facility in Beacon, New York, at age 49. His liver cancer had metastasized and was in his bones when he died. Joseph Nacelli was the funeral director who provided Michael donors from his Brooklyn-based businesses. They arrested him on February 23, 2006, and some of his 122 felony indictments included forgery, theft, and enterprise corruption. Enterprise corruption is a serious white-collar, Class B felony crime, where you knowingly are involved in a criminal organization, and it comes with a minimum prison sentence. He pled guilty to over 100 counts of corruption, body stealing, forgery, reckless endangerment, an unlawful dissection of a human body. Joseph was sentenced 8 to 24 years, and he did his time at Woodbourne Correctional Facility in New York until he was paroled in November 2015. James McCafferty and Louis and Gerald Garzon were the funeral directors from Philadelphia who also owned the crematorium together. Back in fall 2005, Michael told James and the Garzon brothers that he was under investigation. He instructed them to torch their funeral homes and destroy all evidence. They collectively decided to instead take all the paper records to the crematorium and burn the evidence. When the investigators came knocking on their door, they claimed that a flood had destroyed all the paperwork. Besides the profits they made from directly selling donor parts to Michael, the government reimbursed the Garzon brothers for providing funeral services to families that dangled below the poverty line, even though they had also taken payments from those families for the services rendered. This netted them an additional $75,000. Lewis, Gerald, and James were indicted on October 4, 2005, on hundreds of counts, including forgery, abuse of a corpse, corrupt organizations, theft by unlawful taking, conspiracy, reckless endangerment, recklessly endangering another person, and filing false forms. The Garzon brothers were separately sentenced, 8 to 20 years. They released Gerald in July 2019. At age 77, Lewis is still incarcerated in Pennsylvania. James McCafferty pled guilty to conspiracy corrupt organization, and theft by unlawful taking, and was sentenced three and a half to ten years. His sentence was lighter than the Garzon brothers because he cooperated with police early in the investigation, and he contributed fewer bodies to the BTS organization. There were several other funeral directors who were wrapped up in the scam with Michael. Jason Gano of New York was sentenced six to 18 years for scheming to defraud in the first degree, body stealing, and unlawful dissection. Jason was paroled on October 10, 2019. Scott Beyer of New York was sentenced three to eight years for body stealing, unlawful dissection, and fraud. Sorrell Gayton of New York was convicted of scheming to defraud in the second degree, but he had a bit of luck on his side since his conviction was tossed out due to lack of evidence. BTS employees also went down for their crimes. 
Lee Crisetto was a surgical nurse and the lead cutter at BTS. He pled guilty to conspiracy, corrupt organization, and a few other charges in exchange for a lighter sentence of six years. Crisella Dorsey worked under Michael and helped harvest bodies. He pled guilty to enterprise corruption, reckless endangerment, and grand larceny, and was given 9 to 27 years. Michael had a few additional employees who helped with tissue and bone removal. Chrissy Knapp was convicted of over 100 counts of body stealing and falsifying records. She was given 7 to 20 years and was paroled on April 20, 2016. Chrissy ran the Brighton BTS location. They charged Kevin Vickers with unlawful dissection, body stealing, opening graves, and forgery. He received five years of probation and 128 hours of community service. Nicholas Lawyer was only given three years of probation for a misdemeanor of falsifying business records and unlawful dissection because he agreed to testify against the others. Diane Dietz was acquitted of unlawful dissection, body stealing, opening graves, and forgery. The judge believed Darlene was not aware that she was taking part in a criminally run business. The 900 patients who were the recipients of the legally obtained tissue filed civil suits against the processing companies who bought tissue from Michael and BTS. The companies claimed that the sterilization techniques were sound and prevented communicable diseases from spreading. The processing companies didn't directly commit a crime or violate FDA rules but they also didn't vet BTS to ensure that they were following all the required regulations. Many of the victims' families settled out of court, and the processing companies were never prosecuted. Thank you so much for joining me for this episode of Beyond Contempt. Please visit beyondcontemptpodcast.com for links to the sources used in this episode. This episode was researched by Haley Gray. Script writing, editing, and all audio production were performed by me. Thank you, Tiffany M., for your Patreon donation. I appreciate you. If you like the show, please leave me a favorable review on Apple Podcasts. Thank you so much, everyone.